Mark and I are here again today to finish up the great debate between, maybe it wasn't a debate, between Jordan Peterson and John Verveke, which was the conversation so intense that it might be called psychedelic. Actually, it was psychedelic. That's what it did to me anyway. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, and I think where we left off last time, we, we had gone in some depth into the issue of icons versus idols, but that is all wrapped up in John's um, kind of building the tower of knowing, the four Ps of knowing. So I wondered if you could just reiterate the four Ps of knowing, the tower, and then, um, then we'll take a look at their discussion of negative and positive theology. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. The great Philea Sophia conversation. Right? <laughs> it was, it was, uh, conversational jazz, I suppose, or conversational Tai Chi. Yeah, that's what it's like. It's jazz, very much like jazz. Yeah. Yeah. That's an analogy, John. John goes between jazz and Tai Chi a lot when he's talking <laughs> about the dialogos. And so, yeah. So, John's conception of uh, the participatory, which is what he starts with, is, you know, it gives us the options, participate in affordances, generates the field of affordances, right? And the value structure, you know, tells us what, what manifests is, is what Peterson's comment was. And they, you know, again, they went back and forth on that. And then John goes to the uh, perspectival, right? Which is what makes things available to us, right? It makes them salient. Uh, in a way uh, that other things aren't, right? So it's it's the thing that's doing the highlighting in some sense. Kind of what captures our interest. Right, right, among other things, yeah. So it, it captures our interest, it excludes and includes, right, to some extent. Mm -hmm. And then he goes into procedurals, which is skills, which skills for the situational awareness, what do you need to bring to bear, right? And that undergirds your propositional. And the propositional is how everything emerges and and yeah and then peterson pipes up and basically says oh that's what understanding is and mm -hmm. so you can see in this pyramidal model that that john's laid out uh how that happens and then he he, he also claims that what we've done if we've just stopped at propositions and we're not going deeper into procedural perspectival and participatory and 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 you know it's, it's actually a really good way to think about uh, what's happening? Although I'd, I'd argue that we have too much procedures, but that's a that's a that's a nitpick at that point. Well, to me, what stuck out to me about the procedural knowing when when Jordan popped in and said that's what understand means, he was talking about understand the stand under right the undergirding, and so it's his whole thing that he talks about so often is that action needs to come first. You have to act. Once you act, then you will come to the place where you develop your propositions. So if you're not acting, if you're not instituting procedures, I mean, that's really what procedures are, is acting. The, the, the uh, participatory and perspectival can be all up in your head, but the procedural has got to involve the embodiment. So you've got to be, well, <clears throat> embodiment can have more meaning than that, but I mean, the action thing I think is really critical to this idea of undergirding the propositions because people can have propositions that have never been tried out. And that's what happens to so much of our political life. They come up with some proposition and, oh, let's do this great thing and create a utopia, but it's never been tried. And when it gets tried, it's a massive failure. And then they just say, well, we just didn't do enough of it. <laughs> right. Because, because they're, they're not thinking in terms of your actions um affect consequences right and consequences is where you build your propositions you know what's right. working what's not working that of course that's the pragmatic side of jordan right true true, true proposition whatever your proposition is hasn't yeah. been tried right yeah. because it's not pure because it, the only way to make it pure is to put it back in your head yeah and, and yeah there's a deep disconnection between the participation in the thing right actually acting it out and and thinking about it and yeah, mm -hmm. you lose the purity and like, fair enough. Yeah, you do. Right. <laughs> Happens with yeah. everything. And if you start from from the head and you just go out from yourself without without acknowledging the distributed cognition of maybe time, thousands of years. Right. And other people who have other ideas that, you know, maybe you want to talk talk with about your idea, then you lose all that flavor. And if you've never experienced anything, if you don't have experience building something, then you have no idea how uh, how to rate that that proposition 
Mm -hmm. Well, what, what you just brought up, the participatory, takes us all the way back down to the beginning when John was talking about the participatory being kind of the basement. He was saying that it's the participatory that generates our affordances. I thought that was very interesting language coming from a non-deist or non-theist, I should say. <laughs> Yeah, because, because if um, generates the affordances sounds like it's got some sort of creative impulse, right? And um, Philos. and and that well that ties into I would say both N.T. Wright and Esther Meek when they're talking about the covenantal epistemology or the loving to know that our knowing at that level is a kind of participation in the divine. He is offering this to us and we bring it in and then we start working on it. So it's that kind of participation that generates the affordances that, that allows us to see where something fits with us, right? Or to, to use things in a way that is fit for us. Right, well, I think acting in the world or participating in the world is the thing that provides the contrast for us to see, right? And then, oh, and then everything flows from there. Like, oh, well, now once we see, we can make judgments. Well, so when he says participatory knowing, is he also talking about acting or is he talking about um, McGilchrist's idea of participatory knowing, which is the, the right hemisphere um, intuiting the surrounding, intuiting the knowledge available in the surroundings and bringing it in for action on by the left hemisphere. I don't think he has any sense of McGilchrist at all. So when he talks participatory knowing, he's talking about physical activity? Not just physical activity, because you can participate in the conversation, right? You can, you okay. can participate in collective intelligence or distributed intelligence. Like, there are things you can participate in that are non-material. So you can participate by reading or participate by talking? You can participate in your imagination. Okay. Yeah, any, okay. any, any interaction where you're sending time, energy, and attention is technically participation. Okay, so he has a really a very broad scope of this participation thing. Well, it, it has to be. I mean, his four types of knowing are supposed mm -hmm. to explain how you know all of the things. And so they're very broad yeah. because there's uh -huh. only four buckets. Well, I'm just, I'm trying to differentiate it from Barfield's idea of participation. So it's quite different from Barfield's idea of participation, which is fundamentally, I mean, Barfield's idea of participation, which <laughs> I cannot explain. I have to have Michael come on and explain it. But that is not fundamentally about dialogue and, and actions with other people, but it's more about um, the way that we see the world and the way that we participate in that which is available to know in the world. So, um, okay, well, so let's move on from the tower of the four Ps and uh, the next thing that they talked about, which we've already covered, Jordan brings up, they, they had this discussion about icon and idol, which if anybody's interested, they can see our previous video that's specifically about that. And then um, John says something about negative theology and Jordan misunderstands that and thinks he's talking about the God of the gaps mm -hmm. and, and which is not that. Um, and then John is trying to describe the negative theology as being a way of describing God without um, making affirmative propositions about him, but just talking about what he is not. Right. And, uh, and then they move on, and, and I think we've already covered that, and then they move on to the affirmative propositions. So just for those who are going to put in the comments, yes, I know that negative theology is apophatic and positive theology is cataphatic, so... So we can move on from there. And I'm going to uh, share screen and just watch a little bit of this. And, uh, oh, you know what? I think that I didn't gear it up for the share sound and optimize for video clip. There we go.
It'll be there in a second. I think. I don't uh, know what, why that happens sometimes. Here. We cannot, and I think you've said things along this discussion that point to this, we cannot, we cannot abandon our ultimate concern Right. That's his. That's his. Yes, way of that's right. We right? can't. No, we can't. And so we this can't. isn't a negative discount. This isn't a negative definition of God either, because to, to get back to your negative theology point, I've been concentrating in my thought recently on the positive attributes of God. Yep. Uh, and so like the drive towards unity and the motivational hierarchy. That is so Neoplatonic, Jordan. I mean, my gosh, that is so Neoplatonic. That, that well, you know, we were all unconscious avatars of great philosophers, <laughs> and some less unconscious than others, but it's still there. Okay, so let's just, uh, let's just talk about that for a minute. What do you have to say about that? Yeah, well... Right. I mean, we talked about this earlier about the Neoplatonism. It's like, yeah, Neoplatonism was there, and then there was Christianity. I've, I've, I've asked people about this Neoplatonism thing, and it just seems like a very small group of people, by the way. Right. The and Neoplatonists. Oh, yeah, or or a very broad idea underpinning a bunch of small groups of people. But it, it, like Neoplatonism never took off like Stoicism or Epicureanism which I find very interesting, right? So it's like, oh, well, how big was this? Like how influential could it possibly have been, right? Because they just, and they don't have any writings and yeah, it's just on and on and on. So it's, well, it's so more what's, a milieu what's of What's the ideas. historical milieu of Neoplatonism? Hmm? What's the historical milieu of Neoplatonism? When did it happen relative to, Plato and Aristotle, and then when did Neoplatonism come along? Well, see, that, that, that hasn't been made clear either, because I think it, right, I think it's just everybody who came after Plato and added to, you know, and added the pieces that were, were quote, missing, right? And then there is a split between Plato and Aristotle, right, where you were either following one or the other, which is, mm -hmm. you know, and that may, be, that may be a misframing, because a lot of people point out Plato and Aristotle aren't really actually in conflict. They might have different focuses, but they're not in disagreement, mm -hmm. which is a different thing, at least on the core issues that people seem to claim. And then there were all of these groups, right? And the, the Pythagoreans weren't still around, but they informed all of this stuff. And so it's like, oh, okay. But that was heavily ritualistic. So they added ritual in later. I think that's where the Neoplatonic tradition starts to come in is because, so we, we had this ritualistic tradition with Pythagoras and then that sort of goes away whatever the, the, who knows what the story is there it's 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 you know it's one of those stories it's too fantastic to be accurate uh but you know this you know it's not wrong it's just like wow there's a lot there's got to be a lot more going on than that and then there's um and, and then and then there's the epicureans and the stoics and and those last a lot longer too from what i can tell I, you know i didn't really look deeply into it but i've asked some people who who should know and, and they were yeah you know so there's this milieu of all these philosophical traditions that people are living out but they're, again they're not independent of religion like i can't find any evidence there's no I think nowhere in any of the texts do they not mention God or gods. Like it just, Neo, Neoplatonism mentions the one God, like it, it does. It, mm -hmm. it's like, I, like, I don't get it. Like, okay, then if you're Neoplatonic, why aren't you also Christian? Like they're not incompatible. Well, the thing that generates Jordan's comment or, or John's comment about uh, Jordan being Neoplatonic is when Jordan says, um, I've been thinking, I've been spending my thinking time lately looking at the positive attributes of God, the drive towards unity and unity. the motivational hierarchy. Right. Well, let, maybe we could take that apart a little bit. The drive towards unity in the motivational hierarchy sounds a lot like um, the um, orthodox idea of apotheosis, that we're all that we're all being drawn yeah. towards the one somehow. Right. right, so I think John would agree with the unity because that's unity is all over the Neoplatonic tradition, all over it. It's the one and the many, it's very Eastern. It's the one and the many and the one and the many and the, the, there's a pyramid and you're driving up the top of the pyramid. It's like, really? Right, up the top of this triangle thing, huh? Yeah, 
<laughs> it's very strange. It's like, okay. And in, so we're reading the uh, book, The Wisdom of Hypatia, which is part of John's Cultivating Wisdom course, which is a follow on from his meditation course. And um, there, you know, the, 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 so the first third of the book is Epicureanism and Stoicism. And the last two thirds of the book are Neoplatonism. And it's very much talking about this. Well, you're part of the one soul and the one body, but you're an individual soul, an individual body, right? And it's very mixed up in that way. And what it's doing is it's projecting on, so it's, it's taking the, the observational world here and projecting it one layer up into the world of forms, Plato's world of forms, the idos, right? And then saying that same structure exists there. And then it's making all these connections. It's like, no, no, you're connected to the ideal which is again, very platonic, right? Plato has this idea that the way you know beauty is you've touched the thing of beauty as such, as, an, as a form or an, or an idos, like an ideal, like at, before birth or at the time of birth, or, that's unclear to me, doesn't really matter, right? And then that's how when you get into the world, you can go, oh, that's beautiful. And then we all agree because we all touch the same ideal beauty. We don't have the same conception. So Plato is very clever, right? Well, we don't have the same conception, but we all touch the same thing. You know, but it isn't a thing because it's an ideal, it's a form, but okay, <laughs> right? And so the, 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 that whole concept that, well, there's a world soul, a world mind, a world body, a world noose, right? And, and that's all just one layer up from us. It's like, so we have a soul, a mind, a body, a noose, and, it, and it's, it's, all up, it's all also up here, it's mirrored. It's like, oh, maybe? Right. And then well, so, so I've been reading Nancy Piercy because she's going to be on my program next month. And she's written a number of really excellent books. Um, I would say primarily for maybe college age people who are trying to figure things out. One of them is called Total Truth. One of them is called Finding Truth. One of them is called um, Love Thy Body, which talks about the, you know, how Jordan earlier in this video, like around the two hour mark, Jordan and John are talking about the, the emphasis on the body. And Jordan says, yes, that's why Jonathan Peugeot is so strong on the resurrection. And, and I would have said, yeah, and the incarnation too, because the body is very, very important, right? So anyway, um, Nancy Piercy is talking about a lot of these things. And she, one of the, um, when you talk about the five proofs for the existence of God, one of the proofs that they use is that because we are, because we have a noose and because we have a mind and because we have, um, you know, personhood as attributes and so forth, then whoever created us must also have been, a, or let's not say the word create, she just uses cause. Whatever caused us has to be someone, has to be a person who has those attributes. And so that makes the, you know, like this one level up thing. Now in right. my mind where, where the difficulty comes in and I wanna explore this with her a little bit is in this idea of apotheosis or John's idea of the, the many becoming one or something. I feel a little uncomfortable with that because that says that at some point in the far future, I'm gonna be on the same level with the one who created the universe. And I, I, I think he is always beyond. I don't think, I mean, maybe it looks more like, have you, have you read uh, Matthew Peugeot's, Matthew Peugeot's book the, about the symbolism? About language of creation? Yeah. I started it yesterday, literally. Oh, well, you might've noticed that, that a lot of the, uh, the graphic images that he uses with the, with the triangle there is a, there's a dot up here and a line coming down and then there's the triangle. And that's more yep. the picture that I have in my mind. We can get to the top of the triangle through faith and, and, you know, all these other things, but beyond that, there's still this infinite distance between where I am at the top. And, you know, so even if all of us in the body become one, as we are, you know, Christ tells us to become one as he, he is one is going to be, a one that's still on a different level. That's in my, that's the way it is in my mind anyway. Yeah, yeah, it's not, it's not clear to me how the Neoplatonists, like what they're saying. So, so 
saying a cause, that's Aristotelian, right? That's back to Aristotle and final cause and like, mm -hmm. yeah, like it's like, yeah. And then, and then uh, Paul Vanderclay, J.P. Marceau and John Bervicki just released a talk, right? And uh, I, I basically posted two book-like comments. <laughs> oh, I'll have to go in and see. I, I haven't watched that one yet, so. It, it's, it's excellent. It's really excellent. Um, I, I take a different perspective, right? I go, oh yeah, I can do the same trick with evolution. Watch this, right? But it, it doesn't agree with with John's views at all. But it does. It it's perfectly in line with with JP and and mm -hmm. Kind of mysterious. <laughs> so yeah, it, it is sort of dog pile on the rabbit at that point. But I, I can't help it. Like I can just see this evolutionary framework, and I go, oh well, you can just plug this in this way. So I, I and I think that's the that's the deep problem is that you know, even if you use an evolutionary framework, you still run up against the problem of the, the cause. And maybe there's no final cause, but maybe there are lots of possible causes, if you will. And those would be emanations. And then we're picking one and seeing how close we get, right? And then I, that, that folds right into evolution. So it's like, well, you know, go ahead and argue way out of that. And then because you, in order to argue way out of it, you have to say no evolution isn't an observable thing in the world or something, right? Like, oh, that's not that's not a valid process. And so, oh, so, so how, how does it fold right into evolution? Just flesh that out a little bit more. Well, if there are multiple emanations, in other words, if we have multiple, I, I mean, I guess to, I guess to, if I want to put it in, in, in more religious terms, and then I'm not a theologian, so you'll have to afford me some, some grace here. That's okay. Sure. This is just a conversation. <laughs> Right. Well, no, no, We're I want to the audience, right? I just, <laughs> I just want to say like, yeah, I'm going to get real sloppy probably, right? And don't, don't hold me to your religious uh, uh, conceptions because I, I well, don't I know. Well, I think them. it's impossible to, it's impossible to refine your ideas without talking about them. So it's going to come out sloppy in the beginning anyway. Oh, so. oh, I agree. I just, again, my, my knowledge of theology is limited to whatever Paul Vanderclay says, roughly speaking, and I just don't, I haven't engaged with it. That I've read the book, a lot of books, right? Mm -hmm. I've read a lot of the sacred texts, but that's not, has nothing to do with the culture around the religion. And, and that's kind of the point. So, so suppose you have six religions, right? Or something like that. And then they all have slightly different paths, whether they're going to the same place or not, not relevant for this. Each of those paths is an emanation, right? Or could be, right? So we're down here going, hey, we're going to try this. And if it's not close to something down from above, it's, it's going to dissolve, right? And so that's, that's, that, that would be an evolutionary process, right? Because it's like, oh, you tried this variation, this mutation, and it failed, but this mutation over here, which was closer to whatever the emanation is, actually succeeded. So that's one way to look at it. And, and then that's just not related to each book, right? That would be related to each implementation based on each sacred text. And, would, and it would relate to the text themselves, like, Okay, well, some of these texts are going to be more efficient than others, and, and maybe the efficiency doesn't matter so much, right? Uh, and well, and that also seems like it's a little bit connected to this idea that all truth is God's truth. So buried right. in each one of those traditions, there may be 90% of it that's wrong, but 10% of it that's correct. So there is a piece of truth inside every one of those tr traditions, right. and that or, or, is still God's truth. Right. Well, they, they may all be 100% correct, and just some are more efficient than others, right? So, so there's lots of possibilities. That's, mm -hmm. The interesting thing is there's lots of possibilities. And of course, there, there's the bigger possibility, because the, and this is, the th this is what people don't take seriously enough. Like religions, if you want to analyze religions on a, in a scientific framework, which is where you analyze things that, like that, right? You would say religion is impossible statistically because of the number of religions that have started and failed is so huge that it dwarfs the number of religions that have been successful by several orders of magnitude. Because people are trying to start new religions every day. Like, they just all fail, right? And so the fact that we have any at all means, well, that's weird. There must be something there, right? And then it's like, oh, okay. So it's got to be adaptive or we would have dropped it because we spend more time on religion than we spend on anything else in some sense, right? Because it it rules over our ability to trade and, you know, religion's older than farming. So, you know, you're not going to get around that. So there is an evolutionary as aspect in that, you know, some of these major religions even may not be able to last 2000 years or 4000 years or 10, like, I don't know, right? There's no way for me to know. There's no way for, for anyone to know, right? We could, we could probably make some guesses, but 
like they're pointless because we're not going to be around to know that time frame. And that's where, and that's where the hubris comes in. Like, oh, well, we can predict, or we can know this is, you know, this is um, uh, the whole idea around, well, look, we can predict what's best for evolution and therefore we can shape evolution. It's like, well, we can shape evolution because we're part of it, but we can't shape it with an outside judgment because we're part of it. Like we're stuck within that, we're stuck within evolution. So we're not in a place that we can stand to go, well, this would be good evolution, that'd be bad evolution. This is roughly speaking eugenics, right? Eugenics is the statement mm -hmm. that, no, 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 we know what the best format for a human through generations as a single generation being, <laughs> right? Would be, it's like, no, you don't. You're a single generation being. You couldn't possibly know that. It's not, it's not even an option, right? And then, and, and, and it must who's drive to you say nuts when you, must drive you nuts when you listen to people say stuff like that. <laughs> oh, it, does, it drives me crazy. Well, the, the problem is you get Brett, Brett Weinstein. And I'm like, dude, you should know this. Like, how do I know this? And you're tenured and, or were, right? And, and you don't know this. It, it's obvious to me. I'm like, how do you not see the consequences of, of the inability of you as a single generational creature to understand, you know, the best, you know, to judge evolution. You don't stand outside of it. You can't, you can't make that move. Well, I mean, in one sense, maybe that's the whole thing about um, what has happened to the idea of evolution is that it has become an idol. Right. And, and it's, it's become an ideology, right. which is identical to being an idol. So, right. It's the um, underpinning of the science religion. So then you're trapped on the inside of it. You can't see anything outside of it. So I think right. that's where Brett is. He can clearly see all the stuff from the inside, but he can't get outside the bubble at all. And so he can't look logically at it from a, a kind of bird's eye view, so to speak, when getting outside the bubble. He can't do that. Right. Yeah. Mo most people can't do that. I mean, to be fair, it just, to me, it was always obvious. And I was like, why would anybody even need to say that? It's so clear to me that like, you're not going to get around that problem because you're, you're in it. And, and yeah, I mean, that's why I think Paul Vanderpuy is brilliant when he talks about Frodo, uh, for, you know, everywhere Frodo goes, he sees Tolkien and yet mm -hmm. he can't see Tolkien because he's stuck in the book. Like it, everything around him is created by Tolkien, but he can't see the author. Yeah, right. It's the same problem. It's to, that that may be one layer up, right? But it's the same problem. You can't you can't make any and and the real the real issue is they don't take they don't really don't understand evolution much at all. Everything we know about evolution is sample bias and hindsight bias. Not not that we have those when we look at it. That's a different statement. All of the information that we actually have, or almost all of it, is sample bias and hindsight bias because. If something lived for one generation and failed, it almost certainly didn't make it into the fossil record. And so we don't know all the combinations that evolution has tried. We have no way to know any of that. And so we can't say for any given combination that we come up with in our head, or even local tweak in a single generation that we come up with in our head, if that hasn't been tried in the past and failed. <laughs> so it's like, are you sure it hasn't been? And this is very much the problem we live with, right? Like, like oh, well, true socialism hasn't been tried. <laughs> no, but your I mean, all you have has. to do is all you have to do is think about bulldogs and pugs and and like that, where right. human beings thought they had great ideas about how to generate, you know, interesting new species or interesting new varieties of dogs, and and you end up with some poor little thing that suffers all the time because they can't breathe properly and. <laughs> Right. So they might look a certain way. You might like that, but um, but you've you've created a damaged, um, suffering little creature. So, yeah. Yeah. So I like that sample bias and hindsight bias. <clears throat> um, That's what they're working from, mm -hmm. like, and they don't have a choice. Like you, there is no option. You can't. There's nothing else you can, and it becomes clear, like I did this as a kid, but it becomes clear when you run the experiment that Dawkins talks about in uh, uh, the, the blind watchmaker, right? If you actually just run the damn experiment on a computer, it turns out, and you can do this, I did it. It's very easy. They're all over the place. It turns out that, that like, it's like, wow, like every time you run it with a new, with a new random seed, it's like, what well, these things have nothing in common. And that's how evolution works. It's like, yeah, it's like, whoa, like, I don't even want to touch that. Like, cause there's no, 
there's no correlation at all to anything. It's, it's kind of like the computer game of life too, right? Like you can't mathematically predict that. Mm -hmm. Really, it's a computer game in a computer, in a closed world system, and you can't predict it. What does that tell you about the universe? So that's one of those, what they call an irreducible, where you have to run the whole program to find out where it goes. You have to just run it all the way throughout time in order to see where it goes. You can't predict, is that? Right, you can't predict where it's gonna end or, e or when it's gonna end, which is really unusual because in the real world, you actually, many people have a choice. They can predict what's gonna happen or when it's gonna happen, not both, right? Mm -hmm. With that, with the game of life on the computer, you can't predict either. You don't know how, how many cycles it's gonna run. Mm -hmm. Well, that's true of a lot of Wolfram's uh, cellular automata too, depending on which one they start out with. Some of them become a fairly predictable pattern and other ones, there's no way to predict where it's going or what's gonna happen. Right. They become extremely, right. exceedingly complex. And, and some die out and some don't, right? Mm -hmm. right. Some, some live forever, some die very quickly and, and some go in the middle. And it's like, well, and there's no, there's no way to predict that up front. So Jordan Peterson says that a positive aspect of God is that there's a drive towards unity in the motivational hierarchy. So, so he sees a drive towards unity, which the first time I mentioned that you popped in with telos and you, so, um, so let's go back in now and see what they're talking about and I'll share a screen again. Jordan, I mean, my gosh, that is so Neoplatonic. That, that well, you know, we were all unconscious avatars of great philosophers, <laughs> and some less unconscious than others, but it's still there. And so, but but you can't you can't do away with that drive to unity, and and in some sense, you also can't critique it because when we say the good, we assume that there's a unity between goods. I, I think yeah, this is Plotinus's transmoral notion of the good, and you and Jonathan talked about the transmoral notion that 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 there's. Right. He says, look, any sort of moral or aesthetic goodness is ultimately based on the goodness of being. And he says, when do when are we attributing being? He says, we attribute being the more we find that there's a oneness of, of something. And when we understand we are we are we are bringing things. So the, 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 the knowledge is is a process of oneness. And, 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 and what we're doing is we're conforming to the, the reality, which being is a process of wanting. And when those are at one, that is when the heart starts to become, starts to rest from its suffering. Uh, uh, I... Wow. <laughs> Can't go very far in these things. <laughs> um... Jordan says you can't do away with the drive to unity and you can't critique it. Right. Um, what do you take him to mean by that? You can't critique it. Yeah, I think, I think there he's just sort of maybe subconsciously even just saying, yeah, postmodernism shouldn't touch that. Mm. Right. Cause that's his, that's his rightfully his boogeyman, right. It's my boogeyman too. So I'm right there with him. Like, yeah, you can't, you can't, it, and I don't, I don't think it's a you can't. I think it's a, if you do bad things happen. And then in uh, Paul Vanderclay's latest video, which is like three hours, by the way, I listened to it on one and a half speed just before, just before I jumped into this call. Um, he he kind of talks about things that work versus things that don't, right? And it, it's about marriage and this idea that one man, one woman forever is the most efficient way and everything else is so efficient it doesn't, it's non-functional basically is part of his argument. And he says, yeah, you can make the slippery slope argument, but you know, it's there. Like, like once you break that ideal and try to deal with the consequences of that, you can't, you can't live that way. And I think this is sort of the same, this is Peterson's same statement. It's like, if you critique this idea of, of the good and moving towards the good, right? So when we say good, we assume there's a unity between goods, right? It's an ideal. If you critique that, then everything breaks apart and you can't live there. So, so from there, um, John goes on and starts talking about an idea of Plotinus, which is the transmoral what? I, I, the transmoral something of the good, he said. Yeah, yeah. I, I missed that word. Um, 
not familiar, I am not familiar with Plotinus. Are you familiar with Plotinus? No, no. And I didn't do my research. So mea culpa, everybody. I didn't do my research. <laughs> but then yeah, John very interestingly goes on to this idea that that knowledge is a process of oneness. Yes. Right. And so that kind of fits into me with some of this work that Esther Meek has done on knowledge being a way of um entering into a relationship with the divine because the divine is is your your whenever you seek to really know something like you're seeking to really know how to take care of your rose bushes or you're seeking to really know how to fly an airplane you first have to enter into a relationship with it and uh, that relationship will teach you certain things. Here's what you need to do in order to take care of me, or here's what you need to do in order to use me. You know, it would, this would be the affordances. It would be all of those things coming together, I'm sure. But, but in a sense, that, the, that is something that is on offer to us. It's given to us. Just mm -hmm. like earlier in the video here, somewhere around the two-hour mark, John and Jordan are talking about the body is something that's already given to you. And because the body is given to you, when you enter into a room, the room offers certain affordances because you have this body that is already a given. It's not like you can create this body for yourself and then to begin to participate. The body is already there. And then you go in and then you, then you have these affordances that show up in the room. So, um, so in that sense, knowledge is like that. The world offers something to us in the form of these relationships. And that's all a picture in some sense, if, if we build that relationship properly, or like Jordan's always talking about how having children is an opportunity. It's not a guarantee, but it's an opportunity to have a pristine relationship with a child, a relationship so pristine, you'll never experience any other relationship like it. And those... Esther Meek, I think, would say that those are gifts from the hand of the creator. And those gifts are what we interact with when we begin to know something in this relational way. So I don't think it's too far off from what John is saying, that knowledge is a process of oneness. It's a process of coming into contact with the ineffable, in a sense. Yeah, I mean, I guess it, I guess it could be. I think that's part of the great conceit of science, though, right? Is that, I mean, this is the alchemical, right? This is where uh, alchemy comes from, right? Like, oh, if we just purify these things, we'll purify our soul, and you know, whatever, like crazy, you know. And, and we think of it as crazy, crazy stuff now, right? Um, but it, you know, we got chemistry from it, so good for us. But it, it was very much a spiritual journey. And, and I think the problem is when you put knowledge up that high, and I don't think it goes that high, then, then you create a problem. And, 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 and to be fair to John, like I think he's reintroducing the concept of knowledge is also down low because it's embodied, right? Yeah, I was going to um, ask about that. Isn't it both coming up from the bottom and coming down from the top? <clears throat> well, yeah. I mean, I would say that, that, that the body informs you as to your limitations and having those limitations gives you a way to act in the world because without limit, you can't do anything, right? Because you could do everything, but then you can't decide what to do. And there isn't anything to do because there's no limits. And so um, there's, an, there's an informing that happens. And then what knowledge is, it seems to me, is the ability to cohere to the intelligibility outside of the mere information. Okay, give me that again. Knowledge gives me the ability to cohere to the intelligibility. Right. Is that correct? Uh, 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 past the, just the mere information. And, okay, and you're so, going to have to explain to me what you mean by intelligibility that is past mere information. So, again, information is something that's formed, right, relative to something else. But I think what knowledge actually is, it, it has to conform to something outside of that, right? And this would be something like, well, is the information true or not? But so I mean, I mean that literally, All right? So now I've got information, I've put it, I've formed it with something, my perspective initially, right? And then, 
okay, how do I know, right, that that information is correct? Well, I have to match it with something. And I'm matching it with, the, with knowledge. And the knowledge is, is, you know, and the knowledge is not perfect either, but the knowledge is something like, well, this, this system, this intelligibility here matches this knowledge and the information doesn't match that it's bad. If it does, then it confirms it. And it just seems like the knowledge is stronger. So intelligibility is what gives us the ability to determine whether the information is true or not true. Right. Well, the intelligibility is coming from somewhere or something. I mean, when you invoke intelligibility, you really do invoke a telos at that point, for sure, in a consciousness. Or I got you. Okay. Right. So now, now we're back to emanation, right? So what's a true pattern in the world that persists, right? Knowledge should lead us there. But again, the, the problem with elevating knowledge is that we tend to think of knowledge as all in our head, when in fact, knowledge actually starts in the body, right? It starts with what we, what we act out. And, and so that's where the great conceit of the academy comes in, right? Because they think, oh, well, we can just get to God by knowing things. It's like, because uh, knowing, the problem is you can know, there's an asymmetry, right? Uh, Taleb talks about asymmetry. So there's a great asymmetry that I've been using for years and years and years, right? The, the person who knows everything but does nothing has no impact on the world. The person that knows nothing but does things will actually get something positive done. Right, it'll move the world, uh, and it'll change the set of knowledge to some to some extent. The person who quote knows everything, whatever the end of that knowledge is, the knowledge literally ends there. Like that, the, mm -hmm. that's the end of the world. Because until you take an action and change the world, there's no new knowledge, and so it so reciprocally it's, it's, narrows. Yeah, so it's a it's a kind of a sterility. It's like yes, even if you have the finest set of DNA that's built up over the generations, but you never reproduce, all of that disappears when you die, right? Exactly, exactly. And, and you know, they make arguments, well, well, you know, my legacy will carry on in my book. Will it? Most books fail, right? Or, or my legacy will carry on in my teaching. Will it? There's been lots of teachings that are gone. Like we don't have Aristotle's original uh, teaching books. We have what are probably his teacher's notes, but we don't have the curriculum that he actually taught, which mm -hmm. I find very interesting. It's like, well, where, how, how do we have no copies of this? Well, but I think also part of the reason that Plato and Aristotle and, and some of those, you know, the Stoics have survived to this day is that their lives must have reflected a certain level of character and goodness. I'm sure they had a lot of problems. I'm sure that they were they're probably bad white guys. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. But, but there must have been some level of, of uh, maturity and uh, character in their lives that caused people to want to listen to them. Right. And um, or follow them. And, and, to, and to continue to carry on their teachings to other people, where you can have the greatest ideas in the world and write them in a book. But if nobody knows who you are, why are they going to trust what you have to say? You know, if you've right. never acted it out in the world, why right. is anybody going to trust what you have to say? Or, or if you read an idea and you don't act it out, you won't know if it's a good idea or not. Because the only good ideas definitionally are the ones you act out that survive over time. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And, and, and there's a great debate over whether or not Plato would be happy with Aristotle for bringing philosophy into the ac academic realm, into the academy. Because it, it seems like Plato was like, no, 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 don't write any of this stuff down. Don't teach it right? Because it's, it's got to be embodied. And so this is the, this is the, the pivotal point. This is the, mm -hmm. is science primal or is religion? Well, religion is all about how we participate in the world and science is not. Science is about measurement. And what measurement uh, does is it forces you into efficiency. And what that does is that kills potential. It kills it. Yeah. Um... I mean, that's quantum physics right there. <laughs> Once you observe it, all the potential is out and you just have this little concrete point. Yeah. That, that's why I don't, I don't understand why this isn't obvious to literally everyone. Like, like, oh, I went to college and you don't understand this. It's right in the physics. The physics says it quite clearly. Why is this? A, and, and, you know, before that, it was in the church. Like the church. Well, because I, I think people have a hard time boiling things down into principles. It's easier and I mean, and this is, 
uh, this gets into postmodernism and, and quantum physics and everything else, but it's easier to keep things in the, in the ether. It's just floating around. It isn't anything yet. So there's two sides of that, right? If you measure it, if you observe it, now it becomes concrete and you've lost potential. At the same time, if you're not willing to occasionally measure or observe something, then everything just stays out in the ether all the time. Then you've got postmodernism. So right. there's some place in between those two things is where the sweet spot is. And that's part of our struggle in the world right now is that people can see the value in some of what the postmodernists have to offer, which makes them much more potent than they should be. Right. Because we don't have the foundation of how to combat it, how to recognize the things that are valuable, but dispose of the stuff that's destroying us and, and find that sweet spot. Right. Yeah. 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 That's, that's, that's well said. Yeah. So I have a video out on power and I have one out on principalities now. Um, thanks to Paul Vanderclay's wonderful Q and a, uh, last week there, last Friday. Um, I was able to put, put the, the, the last finishing touches on principalities and, and, or at least my articulation of, of what people are on about. And yeah, the problem is the postmoderns aren't wrong. It's just what they're saying is obvious and unuseful. Right, because they're not able to make judgments. They're only able to deconstruct. And, and I had a, a ch another chat, had three chats with uh, Chris Petkow now. And the, th the third one was with uh, Chad the alcoholic and Chris. And you know, one of the things we were talking about is if you go so far as critique or, or to witness your, your stance on something, right? To say, no, 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 I think this is wrong or I think this is right. Um, but you don't go so far as to deconstruct, you're in the middle and that's where you should be, right? Because the, 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 you know, to your point, we have to observe to move, to take action in the world, right? But then how much observation should we do, right? Because we can spend all our time observing, right? And then making things, but then we can't participate with them because we have to observe again. Well, that, that's not good. Or that's, we can spend all our time not get, observing. That's the feeling I get when I'm trying to read Derrida. <laughs> right. He starts down some trail and all of a sudden he's just all up in his head and he's not going anywhere, but it's just going up and up and up and up and up. It's just like, where? Are you? Right, right. But if you think knowledge is primal and going to get you to the answer, right? Okay. because it seems to me, and I've, I've just started reading uh, Language of Creation and, and engaging with the universal history stuff that Jonathan Peugeot is doing, which is wonderful. But it, it seems to me like, scientific truth and religious truth are, they, they actually have to be the same thing, right? So with, but it, the difference is science can't get anywhere near that because even in the ancient Greek conception, science was called natural philosophy. It was a subset of philosophy, which, which had no overlap with religion to the Greeks, none. That's not the way we use it, granted. But maybe we should go back there because maybe the Greek conception of how this stuff works is right. And science is one of many of the branches of philosophy. And that would solve a lot of these problems because then science would stop trying to find the truth because it doesn't have access to it. Because it, it's just one sub branch of philosophy. And it's like, oh, okay. And it's not even religion, which contains truth because that's what informs you as to where to go. And that's how the ancient Greeks seem to have lived. They seem to have lived with the truth coming from religion and philosophy maybe being ways to relate or understand those things in relation to the buckets that philosophy had, right? But it, it wasn't an attempt to find the truth. They already had it. It was right over there. So, so you're dividing, when you divide religion and philosophy, it sounds to me like you're dividing action and thought. So the religion is the action side of it, or, or should be, and then the philosophy is the thought side of it. Right. Right, and, and this is Socrates, like, don't write this down, right? Like, don't write this down. Well, why wouldn't, like, if what but Socrates is doing is talking science to Science is gonna be underneath that, and, and yep. science has to have some action. So maybe there is a wing of science, maybe there's a wing of science that's under the philosophy side, and there's a wing of science that's under the religion side. I, I, I don't think so, because everything's informed by action. 
So even whether or not to engage in science is informed by action. And then this, and this is where the church debate comes in, right? Like, oh, you're saying that even philosophy is informed by action. Well, according, that seems to be what the ancient Greeks thought. Like, I, I mean, I'm definitely there, right? I'm, I'm three principalities. Principality of religion, right? That, that gives you ethics, right? That, that, that's the highest thing. Everything else has to be subservient to that. Then you get the principality of government, right? That gives you the, the laws, the local laws, the moral implementation of the ethics that, that, that's underneath the religion. And then the principality of economics or trade, right? And that's the third, right? That's my, I have a video on that, three frames. But th that's the third frame. And, and like those are non-negotiable. And those are all group frames, right? They have to do with us, not you. Not an individual person, but us. Right. So religion is about us. It's ethics. The ethics dribbles down, gives us morality. That's the law. That's what we do at the government level. And, and, and that also in, at the government level also informs trade. But then it's trade because you know, part of trading is trading morally. Right. Otherwise, it doesn't work. If you, if you trade immorally, then bad things happen. And so, you know, and, and, and there weren't three principalities in the beginning. There was one. Right. There was the Pharaoh God. That was it. <laughs> right. And then it got split out mostly by render under Caesar. Right. And then and then bang, you have two principalities. But the problem with two principalities is that it doesn't hold because it creates a dichotomy. And so when you split that, you created the principality of economics, in essence. I, I mean, it, effectively, when 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 it's render under Caesar, what is Caesar's? What happens is uh, capitalism becomes the. Uh, ideal form of trade, right? Because it's independent of the of the religion and it's independent of the valuation of the king. Because even in feudal times, if you own gold, your gold wasn't worth as much as the same amount of gold that the king had it because because the trading opportunities and the king could take it and right. So there was a problem there. But that all of that splits apart and then you've got three principalities. But, but the, the, the one at the top is still the ethics. Like it still informs everything else. And this is Peterson's point. Like there are things in science that shouldn't be considered science because you should not ever think about taking anthrax and Ebola and trying to combine them. Like that's just invalid science. But it's, it, but it's not an invalid science. It's just ethically invalid. That's why you need the ethics to come first and tell you what to do in the science. Well, yes, I can see what you're saying, but I've also seen where bioethics can lead down some really, really bad roads. And, and of course, this goes back to whoever that guy was, I can't remember his name, Fletcher, who came up with the idea of situational ethics back in the 60s, um, went down very bad roads. And yet a lot of the bioethicists are using his ideas um, that, that your ethics can be built on the the context or built on the situation that you're in rather than on some firm underpinning or some structure from above and so you can decide your ethics based on your context and right that can lead to some really bad places R right no right if you believe you can decide then you're outside of the the religious principality because the religious principality doesn't believe there's a you to decide right and this is this is who are you to critique? You think you're postmodern. Who are you to critique, much less deconstruct? That might be a good lesson. Like maybe you don't know enough about the thing you want to critique to critique it, right? And like, oh, well, you know, but that brings in humility. And like, where does all this stuff come from again? Right? Like where, where is it all, Karen? Where is it all, right? It's got to come from somewhere. It's well, got to so come that, from somewhere. That takes us right back to where, um, where Jordan said, that thing about critique and you said, oh, you think he's talking about postmodernism and that's what got us off on this trial. So let's go back now and see what they said. <clears throat> I think there's something fundamentally right about that. I, I, can I ask you something? Because it, it, I think I'm getting you and I, I, it, it, what I heard you you saying, is like, let's take the metaphor of the idol or, and, and the icon fused. And if there isn't something beyond them, you can't actually pull them apart. That's what I'm hearing you say. Yes, is, is they that, collapse into one another. Yes. Well, look what happened with the deification of Stalin and Marx and Lenin. 
and Mao. That's not accidental. It's and, inevitable. And, and we have the we have we have the deification of celebrities, and we have the deification yes. of, of products, and we have the deification of ideologies. And, and what what I wanted to say, but just before we lose the thread of Derrida, is for Derrida, the, you know how we were talking about how it's trans categorical, but also present within the. That's what difference is, at least my reading of Derrida. It's it's within the text, but it's also points to that which can't be reduced or captured in the text. That's why I think he that because otherwise, like, why is he attracted to negative theology? What's going on there? What's the interest? And it's, so you'll it's, have to delve into the difference idea a bit more and flesh it out for me. I know so, it's key to Derrida's thought, but it's a long time since I've thought about it. And so, what's your what's the what's the current uh, let's say cultural understanding of difference, and what's your understanding well, of it? Well, okay, I don't, I don't know if those two are identical. That would be. No, I don't think they are. That's why I wanted you to say to talk about both think, of them. I, I, I think the Derrida and Foucault are often invoked and very, very rarely read. I think so. When you're asking me about the cultural, I think that that is by and large the case. I, I think there's an invocation of ideas or themes from them, but that that the, the 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 hard work of wrestling with their arguments is often uh, not done so i i hesitate to say what the cultural because I, I i think I, I i don't hear when deconstruction is invoked i don't hear i don't hear difference being talked about or spoken about i hear i hear and so i hear deconstruction being reduced to a kind of demolishment um, as opposed to what I think uh, Derrida wanted it to be. I'm not, I'm not here to defend Derrida either. I have criticisms of Derrida, but I think if we're going to criticize Derrida, uh, I, I spent, I, I, I spent you know, years literally uh, working with it. This is my understanding of difference to answer your question. So the idea of difference is, and it, it, it has to go at the, it's basically like John Searle's argument. That sem semantics is not reducible to syntax, and pragmatics is not reducible to uh, to semantics. It's that whenever I'm saying anything, the way you understand it is how it differs from other things. Contrast class. So when you know you know this from psychology. Well, maybe it's been a while, but you know when you ask people what are some things that are flammable, well they'll say wood because it contrasts with metal and stone. They won't say people, right? Even though people are flammable uh, because it doesn't belong to the contrast set, right? That that that's just sort of that's sort of sort of standard. So the, we understand something in terms of its contrast, uh, something it differs from, but we also defer. We, what we do is we go to the other thing and we get some information that isn't in and we bring it back to often insightfully reinterpret. So we're both defer, differing and deferring in whenever we're understanding anything, which means we can't limit the interpretation of the text to just what is captured within the, the text. Yes, exactly. Well, no, definitely. Of course not. Of course not. I mean, the, the text has a reader. Yeah. It's like there's, I've thought about this, there's a word, there's a phrase, there's a sentence, there's a paragraph, there's a chapter, there's a book, there's a, a library. That's, that's the, yeah, well, that's built into you. You're the reader. You're the reader bringing the consequence of multiple texts to this text, and the text is therefore the interaction between those, that multitude of texts speaking within you and this current text. It's a dialogue. Right. It's the text a is a dialogue. That's right. And it's a dialogue between the, if it's done properly, it's a dialogue between the universal human spirit that engages the golden thread across time and this current text. Uh, and, and, uh, and that's philosophia. Yes, I, I agree. So, and, 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 and you can tell. When I just have to stop and say that was so beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I like, I like how we, how we wrap that up. I mean, this is actually a pretty rich, uh, rich section because like the, the whole point, I mean, it, it's interesting. Like John says, well, if, if we're going to critique Derrida, we should, you know, we should be fair to him, but then he doesn't critique Derrida. Like, well, dude, <laughs> I, I got it. But you just said the positive about the negative, but not that I'm opposed, but like you, you said you shouldn't do that. And then you did it anyway. Um, and, and, but that, that's the thing, like what they're talking about, there is contrast. And so it's, it's interesting because John goes, well, you know, you need the contrast, blah, all right. And I've said this before, you need contrast to see your eyes literally need to move or you can't see things. Like that, that's just how it is. And, and that's back to participation. You have to do things in the world. Otherwise you can't tell 
anything about those things. Like until they're enacted, there's no contrast. And so when we read a text, the thing that, that, that the text does is provide contrast with our current understanding. And, and that understanding is whatever we've read before, plus whatever our personal experience is, plus, plus, right, whatever, right? And so that's where the contrast comes in. And so, yeah, all the important things, literally all the important things about the text are in the middle. They're in the interaction. And, and that is what, what sort of meaning is. And then, you know, it occurred to me that maybe this negative theology and all that, that's where maybe where John is getting some of his religion that is not a religion ideas, right? When he's like, oh, the reason why we can do without uh, a, a, a God, right, is because negative theology works. And it's like, well, no, 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 no. Negative theology only works if there's a God, because otherwise the negative is everything. And then the, the, now you're not probing anything anymore. So I think that's a deep, a deep problem. And, and the, again, the idea of difference is just like, all he's stating is contrast. Okay, but use the word contrast. Why invent a new word? Well, I think part of what he's talking about there too, um, because of the milieu in which he came up with that idea, I was trying to read some history on it. There was a guy named Levi Strauss and a guy named Saussure and some of these guys. And they were talking about their theory of structuralism. And so he was doing a little pushback against that. But I think he was also bringing in that that's also the same era in which Barfield was coming up with a lot of his ideas coming out of the romantic period with this idea of polarities, not just binaries, but actually a polarity where where both ends of the spectrum are connected by whatever's going on in between the two ends. Right. Right. And so what I see is one of the the dangers of the postmodern idea of, you know, Jordan Peterson always describes it as there's so many categories that you can't, you can't know anything, you, you, you know, because there's just too much, it's, it's infinite. So why pretend that you can know anything for sure that there's any truth? Um, so these too many categories and deconstructing everything is looking at the, if you're looking at a polarity or a, even you want to call it a binary moving from one side to the other side of that binary, there's an infinite number of stops in between, just like there is between zero and one. Right. Right. You, you can parse it up however you want to. But looking at it from the art side, I would have to say if I'm looking at dark to light or uh, small to large, I'm also thinking in terms of proportion. And the way that right. I decide proportion is coming out of my own ethic, my own sense of beauty, my own sense of proportion, my own experience. Um, like Jordan's talking about, you bring all the books to bear that you've ever read on the book that you're reading. So it's not that there isn't a truth in that text. It is that each of us brings a unique perspective to the text, but that is not it's not that way so that we can all be chopped up into little bits and be diversified and all be <clears throat> kind of disconnected from each other because we all have a different picture of the text. It's so that we can all bring our perspective of the text back together to give more fullness and meaning to the text. And well, this right, is part of what happens when like, if you're in a Bible study, and you're sitting and you're talking about the, the text, there is a truth to that text that's vital to that text, but there is also a lived experience that everybody brings into the discussion that can enrich and deepen and, and um, magnify that meaning in a way that makes it more powerful to the individual. And that's the way I see it, that that's kind of the work of the Holy Spirit in the group as we're talking together and we're sharing all these things that we are seeing, bringing it together. As long as we stay within the truth, there are things that can magnify the truth in our own lives. And I think that's where, where Derrida goes wrong. He's seeing it as something that deconstructs and splits people apart and brings about right. this isolation and nihilism 
rather than seeing it as an opportunity for more. Well, there's two. Like, there's... like calculus, you've divided it up into these infinite number of parts right. and that teaches you something right. when you bring it back together. Well, well, yeah, but there's, and there's two problems, right? One is, yeah, it'll split you apart if you think you're at the top of the pyramid, right? If you think that your interpretation is the right interpretation. I, I don't think the truth's in the text at all I, I, because the truth is revealed to you through the text. Mm -hmm. Right. But also what you did there. Right. Oh, well, there's a text. Right. And so there's a truth in it. What if there isn't a truth in the text? And this is right. Because, and that's a big problem, because what you're saying is there are some things. And, and this is where Derrida is right. Like if there's no truth in the text, 10 people aren't going to be able to get together, study the text and come to a, a, a cohesive conclusion. That's how you know there's no truth to be found. Like that's that would be definitionally. A, a text a text with no truth, right? So your system works if you're reading the Bible, the Bhagavad Gita, you know, the Quran, whatever, because there's truth there. But there are some texts with no truth or with low truth. And so they're not going to contrast anything in the real world worth a, a darn. And then you're going to get 10 people together or 100 people together or whatever, and they're all going to disagree. And then Derrida is going to be right. But actually, that that process, as long as again you're not stuck in your own head and thinking like, oh, this is my process. That process of getting together and finding things in the text is the process of figuring out. Well, if they split us apart, that's a bad text. And th see, that's what the postmoderns were avoiding, yeah. right? And I think you know maybe they were avoiding that because they knew the the garbage they were writing was garbage and that nobody would interpret it the same way. Which is what John basically said, by the way. But right? he said, oh, well, you know, no one's really struggling with the text in a way that makes it intelligible. Maybe it's not. Like maybe the whole problem is that they're, they're, they're assuming there's a truth in the text that, that, that Derrida and Foucault have written, and there isn't. It's just garbage. Because that could be yeah, most books are garbage. That's the feeling I got when I was listening to John describe Difference, because he's very generous in his description of it. I went back and I read a lot of stuff that I could find about difference and it's all over the place and none of it is this generous beautiful picture that that John Verbeke elicits. I mean he's he's basically talking about a truth in the text that or a, a truth in the difference idea that sounds a lot like some of the things that Barfield might say or Coleridge or one of those guys but I don't think that's what Derrida was getting at at all. Because when I go back and I read what Derrida actually said about difference, it's like, how did John get that out of there? I, I, I just don't get it. He's, he's trying John to resurrect postmodernism. John was bringing all of his his own perspective and his own books and his own thinking to it, and he was saying this is what it should mean. <laughs> right. No, he's he's definitely. I've said this before. He's definitely trying to resurrect Derrida and Foucault and postmodernism. He's trying to save those things and. You know, to be fair, I think Jonathan Peugeot is too. And I'm a hard no on all of it. I mean, this stuff looks like garbage. And and it, it, like, as far as I can tell, any group of people is going to come up with very, very different conclusions. So I'm saying under the, its own principle, if you don't take the principle as a personal principle, but as a group principle, there's no there there. Their texts are not good like, because you can't derive a truth from them that people can agree upon and cohere to and live with it. Unlike the Bible, where you can you can do that trick. Well, if the trick works here and not there, and, and that's when judgment comes. It's your judgment from your observation, but not from your perspective alone. That's where people get confused, right? They think, oh, well, there's a judgment that I can have on the text, and, and, and therefore. It's like, no, the judgment is in relation to everybody else who's read the text, right? The judgment is in the acting out of the text. It's in those two things. It's not in your, you know, conception in your head, which I think is where John's actually stuck in this particular case. Right, because the uh, people that are actually trying to live out Derrida are the ones who are falling into nihilism and despair and... Right. Right? Right, and nobody agrees. I mean, John said that, like the cultural is not there, so... Okay, well, let's go back and see where they go from here. You're doing that because that's the meaning. That's meaning. So I think that's, that, I is think, that, do we agree on that, by the way? I, I because we're both so concerned with meaning. Is meaning the manifestation of the philosophia? I think meaning. In its highest form, I would say then. I would see, say 
I understand meaning when we're not talking about sort of, sort of semantic propositional meaning. When, when we're yeah. talking about the meaning that goes into meaning Existential in life meaning. makes life bearable. Right. Yeah, okay. yeah, that meaning. Uh, so I think the non-propositional meaning. Yes, exactly. That, right. Exactly. Fair enough. Because meaning the experience. is experience. When we say meaning in life, we're using we're using meaning as a metaphor. We're, we're saying there's something about there's something like sentences that's like between me and the world, right? And and uh, and I and I think we we have to remember that that's what we're doing. Yeah, I I think that meaning is meaning is is, is the is the connectedness, the dynamic affordance that allows us to optimally grip the world and thereby affords the cultivation of wisdom. If we think of wisdom, not just yes. as knowledge. Okay, okay, right. so that, well, that's the driving spirit of the West, not power. Right. When it's, I, when it's look, I mean, we deserve to be criticized. I'm, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that, that things are above criticism and that power doesn't play its nefarious role, because it certainly does. And so does the love of power, all of that. Yes. And it leads to terrible consequences. But we're actually trying to analyze that. And we're trying to say, look, it's what you have to pursue wisdom. And you find it in you find the pathway to wisdom in meaning, in again, the manifestation of meaning as an experiential phenomenon. I, I agree with that. And I, I think I mean, I mean, you, a few minutes ago, you sounded like Derrida, and I don't mean that as any kind of insult. Now you're sounding like Heidegger. I mean, the question concerning technology was the whole idea that we have reduced our, our relationship to the world as a relationship of power. And we even uh, think, right? Uh, that, oh, that, that's his claim. I see, uh, I see. I didn't claim. understand that, exactly. Yeah, that's the fundamental claim. The, and so we... we even power, think, control. Oh, that's why David Suzuki criticizes the West and Genesis, because he sees that he's responding to that mastery as control yeah. phenomena, yes. power. That's, yes. Right. Rather so, than the dance. Heidegger, but I think when it's done right, it's the dance. He's Heidegger is worried that the dance will be re reduced to power, which well, I suppose makes it, his dalliance with Nazism all that more. Um, well, guys, we got to stop here. That That's just too much to absorb. Yeah. Um, There's a lot there. There's a lot about the definition of, uh, of uh, meaning, right? Mm -hmm. And so my, my note says, you know, Peterson says propositional verning, uh, meaning versus existential meaning. And my note is no, like I don't know. I'm a hard no. It's the same. Like meaning is not in a proposition. There's no way to make meaning out of proposition, right? And then my in my in my video on 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 uh, on meaning, I basically talk about this, right? It's, it's content which is the definition plus context. And then what pops out of that, what, what emerges from that that's transjective is meaning. And that, and, that, and that puts it all existential. Like there's no such thing as, right? And, and, and so it's interesting. So this is, this is one of the critiques I have of both Peterson and Pravicki, they're middle out, right? They're trying to stand on objective material reality and then say, well, this is this is what it is. But then that that implies that there is a meaning in the objective material reality. No, the objective material reality is the thing we create or co-create, right? As a result of taking the emanation and the emergence and, and putting them together, right? And then if we do it successfully, then it lasts. And if we do it unsuccessfully, it maybe it kills us, maybe it doesn't last, maybe both, right? And so the meaning is the thing that we are create co-creating uh as a result of that right and that and that's where we find the meaning we find the meaning in our co-creation we don't find the meaning in a proposition like you can't tell somebody oh this 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 means x right they have to they have to bring their belief to that equation that's why it doesn't work that way and and that's why yeah, i think their, their conception of power is totally off like I, my, I like my my conception better i have a video on it so you know i, I think i think that's that's way better. Um, and, and it's interesting because, uh, you know, John is like meaning is the connectedness, the dynamic affordance, right? That allows us to optimally grip the world and, and thereby afford the cultivation of wisdom. And that's, that was where I was like, oh, I don't know about the cultivation of wisdom thing. You mean you don't, you don't think that, that the connectedness, the dynamic affordance that allows us to grip the world is a way of cultivating wisdom. Is that what you mean? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure that the, like some people optimally grip the world, right? And, and, and by doing so, they exemplify wisdom. Like it doesn't need to be cultivated, right? And, and you see this, right? There's a lot of people, and this is, this is 
everywhere. It's in movies, it's in books, it's in myths, right? Where you, you know, you go out to the middle of some podunk country where nobody lives, right? Or place where nobody is. And then, and then you talk to somebody who's, who, who's wise. They're, they're not particularly articulate necessarily, right? And they're not particularly uh, up on the latest, right? But, the, but they have this deep wisdom from you know, farming the land or dealing with cattle or you know, whatever it is they're off doing. And, and often the wisest people in, in the traditions are people who are off by themselves in nature. Which is very mysterious. Well, what are they doing? Are you saying that the cultivation of wisdom has to do with the interaction of nature, right, with the person? Okay, maybe, but does that does that mean that the optimal grip is just being in nature? Like that sounds like Mary Cohen now, right? It's like, oh, maybe, uh, I'm, you know, could could be, but I don't know that that's connected to meaning. Like I don't know that's connected to meaning at all. So I think it's really interesting that you jumped on the word cultivation because that sort of went right past me, which tells me that's why I talk to you because you're a deep thinker. So um, if you think of cultivating wisdom, then that means that you are actively doing something to make wisdom arrive. But I think what you're saying is that if you're in the, if you're in the proper alignment with reality in your actions that wisdom arises without you cultivating it. And this makes me think a little bit of the fruit of the spirit because when you've probably heard the biblical teaching on the fruit of the spirit, you know, love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, uh, long suffering, did I say gentleness already? And self-control. Goodness and self-control. These are the fruits of the spirit. Okay. Okay. Now, so you, that's the, the, the biblical language is that it's the fruits of the spirit. So you think about fruit. Fruit isn't something that the tree can make happen. The fruit just happens when, when the tree is, is, uh, gets enough water, enough food, and and gets the sunshine and gets the air and all of that. If it's a fruiting tree, fruit will happen. So it's not something that you can, um, the way that you cultivate it, in other words, isn't to grit your teeth and just push out that fruit (laughs) because that's not going to make you that kind of person that exhibits the fruits of the spirit. But there is a sense in which it's cultivated in the sense that it needs to be nourished and watered and and um, interacting with the environment, absorbing the Mm -hmm. oxygen out of the air and expelling the carbon dioxide and receiving the water and the minerals from the ground. And so you're interacting with the environment. And then what comes out of you is what is natural to a fruiting tree. So what it comes down to is if you're oh. going to be the kind of a person that that becomes wise then it's a matter of interacting with your environment in that way receiving the gifts of the environment and this is the humility and the gratitude thing that jordan peterson's always talking right. about right so um so there is a sense in which there's a cultivation going on but it's not a okay, now I'm going to cultivate wisdom in myself and I'm going to do A, B, C, D. I mean, you can't set it up as a process. Right. Well, see, that's what John's trying to do, right? That's one of his projects, right? So there's written R, there's Steal the Culture, and then there's this training, this meditation and the Cultivating Wisdom course. It's called Cultivating Wisdom. So, Mm -hmm. right. So he, he thinks that we can take people who probably aren't in nature, maybe on the Discord server, right? And, and cultivate wisdom with them. And what I'm saying is, yeah, maybe not. Like, and 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 he's linking that back. To, I mean, obviously, this is all around the meaning crisis for him, right? So he's linking that back to wisdom. I'm saying, well, first of all, you're putting the wisdom before the meaning, and you put the meaning first in that one. That's weird, right? Uh, and maybe it's a valid move. I don't know. Like, but but it's weird because the construction that he built was built in that order, and he places a lot, and probably should place a lot of uh, 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 weight on sequence and ordering, right? But, but also uh, for me, like, like the, the meaning is independent of the wisdom. Like the wisdom, you go to a wise person because maybe you wanna find the meaning in something. Like 
the two seem independent in some important way. And so I, I, that's why I don't like the linking because I, I don't think they're linked in that. They might be linked, they might have overlap, but I don't think they're linked in that way. I, I don't think there's a way in which you go from meaning as connectedness and then some dynamic affordance, you know, to be fair, whatever that might mean, right? <laughs> yeah, I know when he started down that path, I'm like, oh, John. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, I'm going to do a video on this, on these decontextualized words, right? Like dynamic applies in all perspectives. So it, it doesn't, it doesn't have a meaning, if you will. It, it, right. It, 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 you need more context. So whatever a dynamic affordance would, uh, and then the uh, optimally grip, there's a judgment there. Okay. What's optimal? Why is it optimal? Right. And is it, is, is that universal? Right. Because the objective material realists rely on universality of things like optimality, they rely on the universality of judgment per se in order to make all their arguments, right? Because if there isn't a universality and that's what objective material reality is, it's a universality claim. Oh, there's a place that we can all agree on completely. It's like, no, we can't even agree on a place completely. And we wouldn't agree on the interpretation. And we wouldn't agree even if we agreed on the, the first two, we wouldn't agree on what to do about the interpretation. That's why we need emanation because that's the thing we have to point to. We have to point beyond ourselves. We can't point, we can't look at each other and find these things in objective material reality because that's the ground we're standing on. We need to look up to the ideals, to the, to, and this is the thing, like, well, Plato was already there. We need the forms. We got to go to the forms, right? We can't start in the middle. We are in the middle, but we can't start in the middle because then we're pointing at ourselves and not pointing higher. And we need to point higher. Well, the, this whole time that you've been talking, what popped into my head is this very old book, not, well, not that old, not as old as Plato, maybe a hundred years old, by Hannah Whitehall Smith, called The Secret of a Happy Christian Life. <clears throat> and um, when you were talking about the, the balance between meaning and wisdom, or which comes first, yeah, I thought about this story that she tells in the very beginning of the book where there's, um, well, one of the things she talks about, which I think is great, is if you went into a church and everybody was all morose and grumpy sitting in a pew, would you want to go in there? You know, <laughs> of course not. You want to see happy sheep. But anyway, so she tells this story about um, a woman. Well, maybe it was her. I think it was her. She went to a time in her life when she had a lot of problems she thought she had a lot of problems and she heard about a woman who lived up the road from her who had a lot of wisdom so she went to visit this woman and uh, looking for some answers and so she starts to tell her story you know this bad thing happened and then this other thing and then you know and then I and I'm and I'm all tangled up on thinking about this and you know and then I'm involved in this really difficult maybe I don't know what marriage difficult Maybe somebody's after me for the mortgage money. I don't know what the problem was, but it was some big problem that she had, a cascade of problems. And, uh, and this wise woman says to her, yes, Hannah. And then there is God. Mm. And Hannah says, no, I don't think you understood just how complex this problem is and, and just how many elements that are involved in this and just how painful it is. And I just don't, and she tells the whole thing again, you know? Yes, Hannah, and there is God. And, and, I, and I think that's the perspective you have to come to is that once you recognize that there is God, all these other things fall into place somewhere much less meaning than we attach to them because that's not where the meaning lies, right? Right, right. Well, and it occurs to me, like, why did she go seek the wise person, right? Because she was seeking the meaning, right? Yeah. And so if, the, if you seek the wisdom to seek the meaning, the meaning, again, it doesn't come first. It, 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 this can, it's an interesting construction. I see why John did it, but I disagree. Like, I, I just don't, I don't think those two things are connected in the way he's making them out to be here. Well, it's like when, when Jordan Peterson talks about the way that meaning arises for us based on what comes after. Like, for example, you're watching a movie and, and all these things happen in the movie. They might be 
terrible things, but then the ending is a good ending and it makes you go back and rewrite the rest of the whole movie. Oh, now I understood why that happened and that happened. You, you, you get a meaning involved with it, or you can watch another movie where there's all these wonderful things that happen. And then at the end of the movie, it's terrible. And that makes you go back and rewrite all of the great things. It's just like, you know, this is a great tragedy that it happened right. that way. So, so the meaning comes after the answer. <laughs> right. It can. It, can. it yeah. can. I mean, I mean, meaning is that which pulls us forward and, and pushes us mm -hmm. at the same time. Yeah. Right. And, and right. We, we have to have a meaning. We have to derive a meaning to take a deliberate action. Right. But then after that, we may find more meaning because we don't know the results of our deliberate action until afterwards. Yes, yes, and, exactly, exactly. Right. Which, is, which is why the action is so fundamental. Right, yeah. and right, and, but, the, but that takes meaning out of the realm of connectedness, like John, where John put it. And, and interestingly, so John's short form definition for religio is connectedness, which, mm -hmm. which is good, right? It, it, it's good and bad, right? It's like, okay, religio is that which provides meaning because they're both connectedness. Fair enough. I agree, but that means the, the meaning's coming from the religio in that, in that instance, right? And so the so way to create it is too. So we have John saying that, and we have Jordan saying that he has been spending his time thinking about the positive attributes of God. And we're not going to finish this thing again, because we're still only at 216, which means we have 17 minutes left. And I think it's probably time to wrap this up today. So... Are you game for one more shot at this in the future? <laughs> I can I can absolutely do one more because we left off at <laughs> Heidegger romanticism. Yes, and, uh, and I and I think that's a, that's a whole thing right there that we should explore because they had yeah. earlier been talking about Heidegger and debating this whole issue of Heidegger falling in with the Nazis or not falling in with the Nazis, and so. So yeah, I think that would be a good one to, to pick up on the next time. So um, this has been a delight as usual, Mark. I'm always challenged to follow you. And then uh, I learn a lot when I deconstruct what it is you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I mean, I learn a lot from you and I've actually noticed a bunch of stuff in here just because I'm going to have to, uh, I'm going to have to email Paul and tell him to stop messing with my life because I'm just going to blame him for everything anyway. So that's been my strategy. <laughs> so yeah, because a bunch of things came up that he did and now we do this and I'm like, oh, now I'm seeing all this other stuff again that I didn't see the first three times I watched it. Uh -huh. So this is great. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Well, we'll see you again. Thanks, Mark. Bye-bye. Yeah.